Okay, this is Zoom for Friday, May 1st, 2020, for Statics and Strengths of Materials. Again, we hope all is well with you and your families. And um, I want you to go to Vanco Hall, and we're gonna show you some of the updates that we've done so you can um, download those files as we talk about them. Um, later this afternoon, I will uh, grade the deflection calcs. And uh, so I've also updated the deflection lab handout, which we're going to go over first today. That'll be a homework assignment for, say, uh, I don't know, Sunday or Monday. We'll, we'll decide on that. And then I've also updated the deck load trace for columns. It's been up. It's been uh, updated for deflections. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, columns today. And also we threw in a couple of very quick symmetrical calculations for the girder. We're just basically running out of time. Um, next week is the last week of Zoom lectures. And then we will next week decide on when to give the final, the week of May 11th. So that's coming up really fast. Um, so uh, that's the update on Vanco. So if you were to go to the Deflection Lab handout, updated where it says updated 5.1, and this is what you should see. So let me just move this little gizmo up here. And so this is the um, this is the deflection lab that we would do in Smith Hall. This is the one we did last year. Um, if you take a look at this, it's very basic. We just took a wide flange beam, put a couple of steel angles on the end to act as reactions. Took a two by four, found the cheesiest one I could find in the lab. And um, we deflected it. We put a point load in the middle of the beam. And so this is the free body diagram taken from uh, chapter eight, which shows a, uh, a point load in the middle. We are, oh, we're kind of ignoring the linear load. And so this is the formula that you would use for the maximum deflection. PL cubed over 48 EI. That's uh, very similar to the uh, homework that you gave us in the, um, let's see, we'll go to the load trace. That'll get me in the ballpark. All right, so we did this. This was the one that we used for the deck. Okay, and I think I got 52 out of 56 of uh, homework, so that's that's pretty good. Okay, so there we used a different maximum, uh, a different formula for the maximum deflection because it's based on a different loading. So if we go back to this one, you now have uh, PL cubed over 48 EI. You've got to calculate the moment of inertia. Uh, we're looking at a two by, you know, we did this, it's, you know, typically it's one and a half by three and a half, but we took the digital micrometer and measured the height. Um, so you're going to, you're going to fill in all of this chart. And we, we said that on the last one. I know it, it, it was there, small print, but it was there. And then you're going to show the calcs for the second test, just for the second test. You're going to show those calcs by hand. No word processing to do the calculations. And so you're going to calculate the moment of inertia. And then you are going to calculate the maximum deflection based on loading and the uh, orientation of the two by four. So it's a two by four. If we laid that thing flat, it would be a four by two. And um, 
So a four by two, the height would actually be the inch and a half. So that's why, you know, if a two by is laid flat and loaded, it doesn't have a very big moment of inertia, so it's, it's not very stiff. Now in this one, what we actually did was we measured, we physically measured the deflection. And so what we want you to do is, after you calculate the maximum deflection for each of the loading scenarios, and that's gonna, so this right here is gonna go right here for each of the three. And for the second one, you're gonna show the calcs. And then you're gonna compare it to what we actually physically measured and see if they were close. If they weren't, explain why. One of them might be the fact that the, um, the Roman, or the, um, the universal testing machine is, uh, is so old that the Romans used it when they tested the concrete for the aqueducts at Segovia. So that could be a reason, but give me a reason. They should be very, very close. They should be close, and if they're not, see if you can guess why, why they're not. Um, one of the hints that I've added, we've talked about, but I figured I'd, I'd put it in writing, is use the Excel file. And the Excel file, I believe, yeah, statics e-files. The Excel file is within uh, that folder right there. So you, you can go there and then you can actually add the loading and then it'll, it'll uh, give you all of these answers. So you should be able to, uh, uh, to get all the answers uh, when you check the Excel file. And then that'll help you run the calcs. If you go into the Excel file, um, I can't show you that one. If you go into the Excel file, let's do that again. Go back up here. I don't know how much Excel, some of you have had a lot of Excel and uh, some of you have not. But the beauty of the Excel is that it will show you, um, whoops, it'll show you so there, there was the ground freezing. So here's all the formulas. You look up in here and you can always find the formulas. And, and uh, just practice with your calculator because that's gonna help you for the, uh, for the test. Okay, so that's, um, that's some more helpful hints. So Wait, what do we use for the, um, for the load in it? Oh, okay, I see now. Yep. So I was gonna say, what's the P? And then I just realized that was load. Yeah, well, on the last one, on the ground freezing, I didn't give the load. And yeah. uh, full disclosure, I forgot, but also full disclosure, it made you go into the Zoom and find it. And what I've been telling the freshmen, I'll tell you the same thing to you. Uh, if there's any of these things that you're struggling on, you want to go back to the, to the YouTubes and literally start and stop the YouTube. Start the YouTube where it does a calculation, stop it. Then go do your calculation, then start it again. Um, you know, God willing and the creek don't rise next semester, hopefully we'll, we'll be in person. Um, I may start to uh, uh, record some of my lectures in person and then just post them to YouTube. Uh, not making any money yet, just kidding. So um, the last thing you're gonna check is the um, this over here, the allowable deflection, which is based on this uh, little chart, table 8.2 out of, uh, or this is table 8.1 out of the book, is it's just a, uh, we're going to use the least restrictive um, allowable deflection, which is the smallest number below the, the, uh, the span length. So L over 120, okay, these are like L over uh, 360 is very restrictive. It, it does not allow a lot of deflection. And you can see with a plaster ceiling, you want that, uh, that, those joists to be as stiff as possible so the plaster doesn't crack. Also, we talked the other day about using 
uh, allowable deflections for the brick shelves for Evan and Tower. So you gotta show this. Now the one thing you gotta watch on this one and this one are the units conversions. Okay, you gotta show how those are converted. And that's where you can, uh, uh, you can use the Excel to help you with the formulas. Once you do the allowable, then we're gonna ask, again, just for the second, um, the second test that we ran, is it pass fail when you analyze the maximum deflection from the formula based on the loading versus the allowable deflection? And then if you look at the actual, right? Does that, is the actual less than the allowable? The one that we physically measured. And that's that, okay? Um, so that's gonna be one of the assignments. And as we go through the other one, then we can decide, I think there's, um, 11 of you, so you get to decide for the whole group as to when these uh, need to be done. They gotta be done, let's see, our next Zoom is uh, Tuesday at 6 p.m., so we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll probably have one due Sunday and, and one due, say, Tuesday by noon. Um, so, any questions on this? It's pretty much an extension of what you did uh, for the last assignment. Uh, you'll see it quite a bit on the final. The final is comprehensive. Um, uh, don't forget, I haven't checked the, uh, uh, when the unit's quiz 12 ends. It might have ended last night. I don't know where it ends tonight, not sure. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for the unit's quiz uh, number 12. And then next week we will do a units quiz for number 13. And during finals week, we're gonna throw one more units quiz at you uh, to help your grades. Because if you study your units, don't forget, the average of all those units quizzes counts as two hourlies. Okay. Um, I gotta move this here a little bit. And we gotta let somebody in here. Everybody okay with the deflection laboratory? Next week's labs, we're gonna talk about uh, columns and we're gonna talk about connections. Running out of time. Later, mi amor. Question. Yeah, I got a question. So I, I'm just curious on what does that 120 stand for? I know that the higher the number, the, the less deflection, but what, is, what does that number represent? It's, they've actually literally run a bunch of uh, tests. Um, you know, ANSI is one of the big one, American National Standards Institute, I think it stands for. Uh, they literally run tests and they say, how much deflection would a plaster ceiling allow before you get into a, a cracking issue? How much deflection does a, a steel angle that supports the brick at every floor of Evan and Tower, you know, how much are we gonna allow that to deflect before the, it starts to create stresses, not only on the brick sitting on the angle, but on the brick directly below the angle. How much of an expansion joint do we need based on deflection? So these are literally tests that are done. Uh, private testing companies will, will test the ASTMs, uh, which are the test procedures. ASTM is American Society for Testing and Materials. So this is kind of like a best practices from the code. They literally run these tests. Another one that I've always been interested in are the fire, you know, that they test the fireproofing, say on structural steel, or they test the fire rating of a sheetrock wall versus a concrete block wall, versus a concrete wall. So this, again, literally physical tests that are run uh, in certified labs, and that's where they come up with these numbers. Thank you. Now, again, um, you know, the, the brick shelf, the steel angle that holds the brick on E-Tower, doesn't literally have to fall off the building to fail. It could deflect so much that it starts to fail the brick. 
even just to crack it, if you will. So it's, it's um, um, some pretty interesting stuff that the, uh, the testing companies do. I'm gonna, write, I'm gonna see if I can find a website. And see if I can find, uh, find some information for you. I know years ago we saw on a, on a DVD a company that would build a mock-up of a curtain wall. And that was um, structural steel, uh, the brick shelf, the brick itself, the window, the flashing. And then they literally would set up uh, huge fans along with a, um, uh, a water manifold and literally blow water against this mock-up and check for water infiltration. It's, um, and a lot of the projects require that um, as part of the, uh, the submittal process. Okay, any other thoughts on this? So that's 20 minutes. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna go to is the updated, again, it's on Vanco. And again, to show you, the deck load trace updated for deflections and columns. Okay, so it's right there. So you're gonna open up that. I'm gonna uh, do it in Word so I can uh, change any mistakes. Uh, all I do is I just keep adding on to this. If you're taking structural theory in the fall, I'm telling you this is gonna be a really good uh, example um, to keep looking back at as you get into uh, structural, the structural theory course. And somebody asked me the other day, and, and uh, I agreed, I'll leave the, uh, the YouTube uh, uh, lectures uh, accessible uh, for, uh, for next semester. So we're gonna talk about the girder loading. And since we're running out of time, we're just gonna do some simplified math. But basically we say that, let's zoom in a little bit, is that the girder had a point load every 16 inches. And that point load was from the reaction that you calculated of the, um, the deck joist. So if we go all the way back to here, right? So we did the reaction of this, these interior deck joists. There is a slight overhang. So the reaction here of the deck joist is then transferred or we trace it to the girder, okay? And the girder is three two by tens um, screwed and nailed together. So the question is, how do you calculate the loads on the girders? And if we had time, we would have you solve for the shear moment dot, we'd have you solve for the uh, reactions, and we'd have you solve for the shear moment diagrams, and then we would have you find maximum shear, maximum moment. Then you would do the allowable stress calculations, just like you did for the two by 10 deck joints. Okay, and then here's a shot right here. So here you can see the girder. Girder's a little bit different on this actual photo, but you've got the deck joists that transfer their load to the girder. And then eventually next week, we'll talk a little bit about the ledger and what load is then transferred to the fasteners, which are fastened into the concrete wall. So as we walk down the yellow brick road, if you look at your, your reactions, and I gotta go to my, my answer sheet. This does not show the answer sheet, but you got them. That reaction R2 is 786.7 pounds. 786.7 pounds is R2. 
And that's where I took that reaction, which is facing up in the deck joist free body diagram, now has to face down Right now, each one of these is 786.8 pounds or seven, eight. What did I do? Get that wrong. 0.7. 786.7. There we go. 786.7 every 16 inches. A little less at each end, but uh, we're just going to do the worst case scenarios. We did not analyze the end um, deck joist for this project. We only did worst case scenario. So how do you take 786.7 pounds per 16 inches and get it into a linear load, a PLF? I think I can do this on Word rather than uh, go to the camera. If it doesn't make sense, then I'll be more than happy to go, excuse me, to the camera. So we could Take this and 786.7 pounds per, what's 16 inches? 1.33 feet. And I don't know why that didn't show up. So let's uh, get that out of there. This must be a, yeah, that's why. Let's see if we can, now we'll do it right here. So 786.7 pounds per 1.33 feet. So let's do that in, uh, in red. Equals, so if you get your calculator out, 786.7 pounds every 1.33 feet is about 592. We'll go to the nearest 592 pounds per foot. Okay, 592 pounds per foot. And that's so the linear loading on the girder. Okay, it's the linear load on the girder. So that's 592 PLF. So the question becomes, and that, well, hell, yeah, that's where I should put it. The loading PLF box, we'll do this. Take that, take that, okay. Okay, now the reaction calcs, right, since we're running out of time, damn it. So we're not gonna give you a uh, Schumann diagram uh, assignment. We're not gonna go through and do any long calculations on the uh, reactions for the, uh, at the girders. Now the reactions, what's holding up the girders? The posts the columns, if you will. So let's use um, let's use tributary length. Each column And this is each interior column. Holds up how many feet of the girder? If you take R2 or R3, well, this one holds half the distance to the next column or the post, and it holds from here to half the distance from here. So each one, it holds up three feet plus three feet equals six foot tribute. Oh, that's not right. Equals six foot 
tributary length. And I'll tell you, next semester, in structural theory, the use of tributary widths and tributary lengths and symmetry is going to save you a shitload of time. Whoop, shouldn't have said that. Um, let's see if uh, YouTube takes me off for saying that. Hopefully they won't if they do, I'll send them an apology. So does that make sense? Each of those posts is responsible for half the distance to the next one. So then if you take 500 and Five hundred ninety-two pounds per foot times six feet. So five ninety-two times six feet is three thousand five hundred and fifty-two pounds. And this is the maximum load. Sometimes we call that the critical load. And I'm taking a little bit of liberties on on some of this because this is an introductory course and you get so it's the critical load on a post okay. and that's that's just doing it simplified that gets us in the ballpark what's the load on the post now we can also talk about the fasteners within you know, within the girder and, and stuff like that, uh, we're, but we just run out of time. But what they do in structural theory is they just keep adding on to this. Okay, everybody okay with that? Yes. Yeah. So, that's our critical load on a post. We're not gonna do the shear moment diagram. There is no assignment for the shear moment diagram. So we're not gonna do uh, Vmax, Mmax, and then get into the stress calculations. What we, what we do wanna do for stress calcs is we wanna get into um, column design, just a, or column analysis. We really have run out of time for beam design. Um, we've run out of time for column design. This course is more of an analysis emphasis. We, we typically do a little bit of design. And to be honest with you, the way you do the design on a beam, real quick, because I know you're dying to know this. Whoa, gotta watch that sarcasm. Um, if you have an allowable bending stress and you know the maximum moment from the shear moment diagram, you can calculate the section modulus or the moment of inertia that is required as a minimum to make sure you don't exceed the allowable bending stress. You can do the same thing with the shear stress. So you solve for the section modulus and then you go into the book and you look at all of the beam sizes and you pick the most economical, not always the most economical but for the most part, the most economical cross-sectional area, and therefore the most economical beam. For our sake, it's a deck joist. So that's how you do a little bit of, uh, of design. And you'll get into that quite a bit in structural theory, but it's the same following the yellow brick road. Okay, so let's go back to here. And then where we wound up is we had uh, 3,552 max critical load on a post. All right, so 3,552. And that's what we calculated from the previous page. Okay, so what do we do with that info? And if we go back to the text in chapter four, they showed us this little diagram on page 219. And so eventually we're gonna do a little bit of an analysis on that footing. In other words, what is the actual bearing stress of this critical post load on the column, on the post, which again is going to act on the concrete footing. 
and then eventually the concrete footing acts on mother or father earth. And we can actually, we can, we can calculate the actual stress on mother earth and then see if that is less than what we're allowed to, the, less than the allowable pressure for mother earth based on whether it's a cemented soil, what we call around here a hard pan, if it's sand, if it's clay, if it's a bedrock, if you will, okay? So we're gonna talk um, um, Tuesday about these calcs. We're gonna walk you through these calcs. And guess what? Pressure equals load over area. It's, you know, we're taking the critical post load. So take a look at these for, uh, for Tuesday. And it, that's the beauty of chapter four. If you're taking structural theory, keep that book. So there's some reading, getting back to this, there's some reading for the next Zoom on columns. Uh, I just realized that uh, I have not scanned JN's chapter 12. I will do so and I'll have that on, uh, on Vanco. So skim over that. Again, we're at this point, we're gonna deal with just simple stress on columns. We will talk a little bit next week about the buckling effect or what they call the Euler formula, which says that a column, as it gets taller in between supports, will fail in buckling rather than in compression. So we'll show you some, uh, uh, some test video. Hopefully I can find them. Still don't have a lab. And uh, we'll show you some nasty formulas that you're gonna deal with next semester. Yeah, they're long and nasty, but they're doable. And we'll just talk about it. We'll just, you'll look at each part of the formula. The text does a nice job pages 438 to 443. Then they talk about stability on 449, and then some of the long and nasty formulas on 474 to 480. But for the calcs that we're gonna do today in this Zoom lecture, we're gonna treat the post as a short column, okay? And the simple stress, um, with, not versus, with the allowable stress will govern, okay? The simple stress will govern. Well, what's simple stress? Load over area, right? What's simple pressure? Load over area. Where you get into long and nasty formulas is when, as I've said, that post gets taller and it has buckling potential. So from page 278 in the text, we go to page um, 278. And we can look at the, uh, I think we talked about um, Doug Fir Larch North for beams and posts. For beams and posts. Uh, we're going to look at uh, axial compression. Um, eventually we'll talk, I don't think we'll get to bearing, but think about it. That's the bearing surface. In other words, say a deck joist acting on a uh, ledger beam. You know, is the surface, the bottom surface of the deck joist is bearing on the ledger beam. We can calculate a bearing stress. But this we're gonna look at an allowable axial compression. The big F is the allowable, and the little c is in compression. So we're allowed 1,000 PSI. We're allowed 1,000 PSI. So we go back to our load trace right here. page 271 in the text. Oh, okay. so we go back to our formula, P max divided by cross-sectional area. I don't know if I ever said what size was the post, the cross-sectional dimensions of the post. So let's go back, 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 back. Yep, we got five by five posts. 
Again, there were four posts in our calcs. Um, so the five by five posts are actually four and a half by four and a half. The P max was 3552 pounds, and the cross sectional area is 4.5 inches times 4.5 inches equals 20.25 inches squared. So we go to um, go to this formula. So that's equals 3552 pounds divided by 20.25 inches squared. And so the actual stress is, survey says, 175 PSI, and that's less than 1,000. We're safe in compression. In compression, okay? And that's simple stress. Now, just for the heck of it, um, if, if we did not use a post, so safe and compression, that was a big yes. So just for the heck of it, if we didn't use a, if we didn't use a, a, a concrete footing and that post load was acting directly on mother earth. So let's say without footing, what is the soil bearing stress? Actual soil bearing stress. Now we can say, yeah, we've got the, the, the weight of the, uh, the post, but we're going to neglect that. So we'll write neglect post weight. So that would be 3552 pounds divided by, um, actually it'd be the same, let's see, 3552, that we already did it. How am I doing here? Okay, so neglect post weight. So that would be 175 PSI. I'm, I'm all discombobulated right now. So forget about this. We'll talk about this later. Um, so for now, we're just dealing with the compression. Okay, we're dealing with the, uh, the compression. Okay. So I'll go back and double check this, but I'm gonna have you do this for homework. So what you've got to do is complete pages nine and 10, page nine and page 10 for, uh, for homework. Deck page nine and 10 for homework. Basically just copying the calcs um, that we did by hand, no word processing. And then we'll talk about the soil. I got all uh, confused here. We'll talk about the soil um, pressure uh, later. Okay. So that's yours. Those are the assignments. The one is the deflection lab to review. The deflection lab. So my thought is to have that due um, Sunday night at 11.59, and then have pages nine and 10, and I'll update Vanco, have pages nine and 10, all the calcs that I went over, you write them out by hand, 
If you don't, if you don't, if you cannot print nine and 10, that's fine. Just write the calcs out by hand. Uh, show your free body diagrams. I don't need a copy of this because we're not doing anything. But I want this FBD. Okay, page nine and 10. And we'll have that due uh, Tuesday at noon. So Sunday. And that'll be due Tuesday at 12 noon. Okay. Then on Tuesday, we'll start talking about the uh, columns as they relate to what we call long or tall slender columns with buckling issues. And we'll talk about some allowable soil bearing, um, allowable soil, soil bearing uh, calcs. Okay. So does the, do those two time frames sound doable? Yes. Okay, and they'll be each worth 20 points. So again, we've only got 15 watching uh, Vanco, but we'll, I'll uh, upload this to YouTube and uh, I will update Vanco with the due dates and uh, we'll go from there. So um, just real quick while I got you here, when is units quiz due? I think it was the last night at 11. Was it last night? Okay. So units quiz yep they closed last night so 53 out of 56 good 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 that's what I'm looking for okay any other questions in terms of what what I went over today this will stop the recording of the statics zoom on Friday, May 1st. Again, hope all is well with you and your families, and we will meet again Tuesday, uh, May 5th at 6 